Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, You Can't Handle the Truth. In this video, we're going to be looking at the coherence theory of truth. So, what is the coherence theory of truth? Well, the coherence theory of truth is best contrasted with the correspondence theory of truth, where the correspondence theory allows a truth bearer to be true if it corresponds to some truth maker in the world. The coherence theory of truth, on the other hand, allows truth bearers to be true if they cohere with other truth bearers. So it's important to realize that for the coherence theory of truth, the things that are the kind of truth makers are in fact other truth bearers. It's one of the important differences. The other important difference is the difference between the relation of correspondence and the relation of coherence. So, as I just said, note the two important differences. The relation has changed from corresponding to cohering, and the target of that relation has changed from some truth maker in the world, like a fact or a state of affairs, to a set of truth bearers, a set of propositions or beliefs. If you're confused by my language of truth makers and truth bearers, check out the second video in this series on truth makers and truth bearers. And of course, if you want more information on the correspondence theory of truth, check out the video a couple of videos ago on the correspondence theory of truth. Now, if you're inclined to maybe materialist or foundationalist philosophies, this may be somewhat unsettling or unintuitive for you, that something could be made true by other truth bearers or by other beliefs we have. To help get the intuition that kind of builds into the coherence theory, think of all your beliefs as kind of part of a spider web. They all fit together to form a coherent whole. It's clear when a belief does not cohere with the rest, like a fly landing on the web and wiggling around and shaking up those beliefs around it. These beliefs that don't fit in are false, according to the coherence theory, while the beliefs that do fit are true, because they cohere well with the structure. The two principal points of disagreement among most coherence theorists are on exactly what constitutes the coherence relation and what constitutes the set of truth bearers that can bear this relation to a proposition, or to an individual truth bearer, depending on your theory. There's a lot of different versions of the coherence theory, and it can look very different depending on who you're talking to. One possible option for the coherence relation is logical consistency. Basically, a new truth bearer is true if it is logically consistent with the set of propositions already held. Remember that logical consistent propositions are those that are both true in at least one world. So if you have two propositions that are logically consistent, that means there is at least one possible world in which they are both true. If you're curious about logical consistency, inconsistency, and contradiction, check out my small series in the 100 Days of Logic on those subjects. Therefore, the truth bearer, the spider is on the web, would be true just in case there exists some world where that truth bearer can be true along with all of our others, whatever we're taking as that full set of truth bearers. Or in other words, if it is logically possible for all these truth bearers to be true at the same time, basically that no set of all the truth bearers with the spider is on the web included imply a contradiction. Basically, the belief fits. It's logically consistent. It doesn't arrive at a contradiction in conjunction with the rest of the beliefs that we have. Yet, this is going to seem worrying, though this seems like a really intuitive notion, since it's possible for a set of truth bearers to be consistent with both of two contradictory truth bearers. Imagine that our set of truth bearers says nothing about the spider is on the web. The set of truth bearers implies neither the new truth bearer nor its contradiction. Basically, we have a big set of statements or propositions or beliefs, what have you, and it doesn't say anything about the spider being on the web. So both the statement the spider is on the web and the statement the spider is not on the web are consistent with that larger set. So 
both of them are true, according to this version of the coherence theory. Since the spiders on the web is consistent with the set of truth bearers, by our definition it must be true. But since the spider is not on the web is also consistent with our truth bearers, it must also be true. Therefore, the coherentist would there be committed to a contradiction, because both the spiders on the web and the spiders not on the web are true. Instead, perhaps, we would like to take some version of entailment as our relation, either logical or otherwise, to understand the coherence relation. So, a truth bearer would be true if and only if it was entailed by our coherent set of truth bearers. If we take entailment as logical entailment, what this would mean is that there's no way that the truth bearer in question could be false. Once again, check out the 100 Days of Logic on Entailment if you're curious as to how logical entailment actually works. This means that we would avoid the contradiction that arose with just logical consistency, since if the set of truth bearers that we have logically entails the spiders on the web, that means that there's no way that the set of truth bearers could even be consistent with the spider is not on the web, assuming there aren't any contradictions inherent in our set of truth bearers to begin with. But if there's contradictions inherent in our truth bearers, we already have some problems with our theory. Other philosophers imagine coherence in terms of other types of entailment, more or less strict than logical entailment, and they may also envision it in terms of some kind of explanation or explanatory support. I'm not going to go through every coherence theory here, but just to give you a sense of kind of the layout of different philosophical positions, there are other ways to imagine coherence other than entailment. One may also distinguish between types of coherentists by examining what they define as the set of truth bearers that we are comparing each new proposition to. Usually, they're talked about in terms of beliefs or accepted propositions, basically. Yet, the scope of these beliefs and who believes them is up for debate. We're going to look at kind of three different versions in this video. Some coherents Theorists hold that the set of propositions is the largest set of consistent propositions that are actually believed currently by people. Others hold that it is the set that will be held by humans when we reach the limits of our finite reasoning and investigative capacity. So basically, the kind of ideal humans that have conquered all of science or all of the science we are able to know, those humans, what they would believe, that's what we're comparing these things to. And if it coheres with that set, it would be true. And still other coherence theorists claim that the set of propositions is the set that is believed by an omniscient god. This kind of coherentism fits in well with a kind of theistic, idealistic explanation of reality. I'm not going to get into this conception completely here, but in a future video, hopefully, we're going to look into this conception of reality and this conception of the way that everything works. But for now, we're going to just look at some of the coherence theorist parts of that vision. So, generally, there are two ways that one might arrive at coherentism as a position. One generally arrives at the coherence theory of truth through either of one of two paths, or possibly both. Either metaphysically one is an idealist, and therefore needs a notion of truth that doesn't rely on the external world. Basically, if you're an idealist, you're saying that everything is mental. So it doesn't make sense for a correspondence theory of truth, for your truth bearers to correspond to something out in the real world, because there is no real world. You're basically just talking about the mental world. Or possibly, epistemically, one is already a coherentist about justification, and you want your notion of truth to match your notion of justification. We're going to take a little bit of a look at each of these positions and talk a little bit about the difference between coherentism in terms of justification as well as coherentism in terms of truth. So, in simplest terms, the idealist position is the position that the only states that exist are mental states. There are no physical states. There are only mental ones. 
Since there is no physical world that could make beliefs true, the idealist would struggle to help themselves to something of a correspondence theory of truth. It's not impossible. There's nothing really for the truth bearers to correspond to in their ontology other than other truth bearers, because the only states are mental ones. So there's not some physical state out in the world that could correspond to it. It has to correspond to something in our minds. The easiest thing to grab onto is other truth bearers' beliefs. Since all the idealist has in their ontology is beliefs and other mental states, it makes sense that the things that would make the beliefs true are other beliefs. For some idealists, this means that truth comes in degrees. For more on idealist conceptions of truth that find themselves somewhere between coherence and identity, depending on how you interpret them, you should look into the explanation of Bradley's theory of truth that we just offered in the video on identity theories of truth. Basically, the idealist can end up at a coherence theory of truth in a lot of different ways. Bradley's is just one of them. The theistic idealistic conception is another one. There's a lot of ways to end up there. But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because when you don't have anything other than mental states or beliefs for things to correspond to, there's no sense to make something true based on something out in the world because there's no out in the world for you to have to make something true. As noted above, the idealist theist often arrives at coherence through this route. If they already hold that everything is mental and exists in the mind of God, it makes complete sense that a given truth bearer would be true if it cohered with some belief in the mind of God, since that just is what reality is. Because the mind of God is all there is, of course it makes sense that the only thing that would make something true is if it cohered with the set of propositions that is the mind of God. Once you're already at kind of idealist, theist conceptions of reality, the coherence theory of truth really makes a lot of sense. So while idealism and coherentism seem to go together, if you're a coherentist, does that mean that you are an idealist? Some coherentists don't think so. Coherentists are not committed to the denial of the outside world, it's important to note. Just the denial that such a world has any connection to truth. According to them, it is simply not the physical world that makes what we say true, but the physical world could go on existing in some way separate from what we say about it. In other words, the coherentist about truth is not committed to an idealist picture of reality because they could say what makes something true is that we have a set of beliefs about it that coheres with it there might also be a physical world but we just don't say true things about it or at least what we say is not made true by the physical world what we say is made true by the set of beliefs that we hold together Similarly, an idealist need not be a coherence theorist about truth. They could just as easily hold a sort of identity theory of truth as Bradley seems to, though this is somewhat contentious. Idealists probably also could be something of a deflationist about truth, basically saying that the concept of truth is in some way not as interesting as we think it is. If you're interested in more on the theories of deflationism, check out a video coming up soon in this series. Okay, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about the one road to coherentism via idealism, we're going to talk a little bit about coherentism kind of through the more epistemic route of the coherence theory of justification. When you hear a philosopher say that they are coherentist, it's important to establish exactly what they mean because there are two different positions that are often represented with this word, and they're very similar. There's an important difference, though, between coherence theories of truth and coherence theories of justification. Hopefully in a future series on epistemology, we're going to talk more about coherence theories of justification. But we'll mention them a little bit here. This is especially difficult to distinguish as they're very similar theories and often a philosopher will actually hold them both. Let's look at the specific differences, though. So, we have a coherence theory of justification on one side and a coherence theory of truth on the other side. 
Coherence theory of justification says if a truth bearer coheres with our set of beliefs, we are justified in holding it. While the coherence theory of truth says if a truth bearer coheres with some specified set of beliefs, then it is true. Note the two important differences here. One, the coherence theory of justification is talking about a belief cohering with our personal set of beliefs in some way. Whereas the coherence theory of truth may have that belief cohere with some set of beliefs, propositions, statements that we have no access to, such as all the beliefs held in the mind of God. The other important distinction is the coherence theory of justification says we're justified in holding that belief that coheres with our other beliefs. Not necessarily that it's true, just that we're justified some way in holding it. We're allowed to hold it. We have whatever we need extra to get from true belief to knowledge if we're holding it. Whereas the coherence theory of truth says it is just true. It doesn't even mean that we're justified in holding it. It means that if that belief coheres with that set of truth bearers, it just is true. So, in justification, if a belief is true and it coheres with our other beliefs, then it can rise to the level of knowledge, no matter what your theory of truth is, if you hold the coherence theory of justification and think the justification is sufficient to warrant. The coherence theory of truth, on the other hand, coherence is what makes a belief true, not what gives us reasons to hold it. Once again, coherence is what makes it true, not necessarily what gives us a reason to hold it. So, does a coherence theory of justification imply a coherence theory of truth? Well, not necessarily. One could hold that what makes a proposition true is its correspondence to the actual world and hold a correspondence theory of truth. But since perhaps we're skeptical that we could have objective access to the actual world, what might make it justified is that it coheres with our other beliefs. So you could hold a correspondence theory of truth, so what makes things true is the actual world, but a coherence theory of justification. What makes it justified for you to believe that is that it coheres with your other beliefs. For example, one could believe that the reason the proposition the spider is on the web is true is because there's some objective fact about the world that makes it true. However, they might also hold that the reason we're justified in holding it is because it coheres with our other beliefs. Say that our eyes function and we see a spider on the web and we believe that our eyes are reliable and so on and so forth. We have a set of beliefs that coheres with that proposition. What then of the opposite, that coherence theory of truth entails a coherence theory of justification? This seems equally implausible, as one that holds a coherence theory of truth might just as easily hold, for example, an externalist theory of warrant. If you don't know what that means, we're going to get to it in a series on epistemology, hopefully coming sometime soon, which claims that one can have knowledge without internal justification for it. The coherence theory of truth is a co or rather, the coherence theory of justification is a theory of internal justification, not a theory of external warrant. I'll explain this a little bit, and then, like I said, we'll get more into externalist theories of justification and warrant in another video. For example, one might hold that knowledge is a belief that is true and perhaps acquired through a reliable method. What makes that belief true is that it coheres with a set of propositions, but what makes that true belief warranted, and therefore knowledge, is that it is acquired by a reliable method. So imagine I form the belief a spider is on the web. I form the belief because I receive sense data that a spider is on the web, and my sense data is standardly a reliable method for forming true beliefs. So the belief is warranted. However, perhaps what makes the belief true is the fact that it coheres with a set of propositions that will be held by humans when they reach the heights of their investigative abilities. This would be a case where one holds a externalist theory of justification or warrant, while one holds a coherence theory of truth. The point is that these are separate positions. They don't imply each other or entail each other in any way. You can hold one and not hold the other. 
But it's important to note that this doesn't mean that coherence theories of justification and truth are incompatible. Merely that they're just distinct positions that they can be held on their own. You don't need to hold one to hold the other, but you can, and you're allowed to. Now we're going to look at a number of objections to coherence theories in general, as well as to some specific coherence theories in particular. So, specification is a famous objection. So Bertrand Russell has offered one version of what is known as the specification objection to the coherence theory of truth. It states that each of two statements, Oscar Wilde died in a bed, and Oscar Wilde was executed by firing squad, cohere with a different set of propositions. Yet clearly, only one of them can be true. So perhaps I have in my head a set of propositions that coheres with Oscar Wilde died in a bed, and you have in your head a set of propositions that coheres with Oscar Wilde was executed by a firing squad. Clearly, though, these are contradictory. So our coherence theory can't hold them both to be true. There have been a number of responses posed by the coherentists to defend their position in the face of this objection. One might say that we choose the set of propositions that makes the first statement true, since those are the ones that maybe correspond to the facts of reality. But this really makes the theory nothing more than kind of a complicated correspondence theory, or at least some kind of hybrid theory that attempts to kind of marry these two theories together, a kind of pluralism, if you will. It's not a solution if you want to stick with pure coherentism, but it may be a possible solution if you're willing to go with kind of a pluralist picture of truth. Another defense that has been proposed is that one might take the set of propositions or beliefs that satisfies some criterion. Perhaps it's larger, it's more comprehensive, it's simpler, empirical adequacy, and so on and so forth. Basically, what this solution is saying is that between me and my friend, if I have the bigger set of beliefs, mine is going to be the true one, whereas his is not so true because he has a smaller set of beliefs, or he doesn't have a comprehensive set of beliefs, he doesn't have a simple set of beliefs, he doesn't have an empirically adequate set of beliefs. There are two problems with this solution. First, it's possible that two systems are equally large, or equally satisfy whatever the criterion we choose is, or perhaps that one that holds the proposition that we consider false, in fact, satisfies the criterion more than the other system. Maybe we take as our criterion that it's larger, and my friend, who believes something that we would generally consider to be false, that Oscar Wilde was killed by a firing squad, has actually a larger set of beliefs than I do. Does that mean that it becomes true, not just justified, but true, that Oscar Wilde was killed by a firing squad? I think a lot of people would be concerned to bite that bullet. However, there's a deeper problem with this response. So, imagine two systems of beliefs. One, system A, that satisfies one criterion. That the larger system of beliefs should be chosen. So, it is the larger system. And includes in it the criterion that the larger system of beliefs should be chosen over another system. The other system of beliefs satisfies a different criterion, we could call it system B, that the simpler system should be chosen. So, it is in fact the simpler system. So, B is both simpler and includes the criterion that the simpler system should be chosen. A is larger and includes the criterion that the larger system should be chosen. There's no way for us to pick between these two systems since they contain the very criterions that tell us which system we should pick. Another proposed solution to this objection is to assert that the coherence theory is not talking about any arbitrary set of propositions, but perhaps a specific set of propositions, kind of along the lines of some of the sets of propositions we listed nearer to the beginning of the video, either those that are believed by some omniscient god, or the largest consistent set between everyone, or maybe those that we will agree to once we've reached the end of our investigative abilities. This response is insufficient, but the reasons that it's insufficient for each type of coherence are going to be different, so we're going to treat them each separately. First off, let's talk about the theistic coherence theory that places all of the believed propositions in the mind of God. 
No, this is going to depend on us establishing that God is not a deceiver of some kind. And I have some serious concerns about this project that I express in my series on the ontological argument, but also in a number of my other series on the arguments for the existence of God. The ontological argument is just the only one that really puts forward an argument for the conception that God is not a deceiver. It's a concerning thing, really, to justify. So you need some really strong argument that proves that God is not a deceiver. Why? Well, let's take a look. If it's possible, if there's even the slightest possibility that whatever holds all those propositions is a Cartesian evil deceiver, basically all-powerful, all-knowing, just not all good, then it could be the case that what is actually true is that Oscar Wilde died in a firing squad because that's what the deceiver believes, or that's what coheres with the set of propositions that the deceiver believes. This is sufficient to make it true, because that's the only criterion we have. But... We are deceived into thinking that it's something else. This seems to be really troubling for our comprehension of truth, because it's whatever an evil deceiver believes. It could, in fact, be that Oscar Wilde was a squid that was killed by a passing boat. We have no idea. The problem here is that this is not what our conception of truth is. It seems that we only like the idea of God kind of holding the keys to truth if it's our truth that he's holding on to. If you have an all-good God that doesn't deceive us, surely what appears to us in some way would be true. Basically, the notion of truth becomes arbitrary if we can't establish some other properties of God, and I'm skeptical to say the least that that's even possible. As for the claim that we should simply take the largest consistent set of all actually believed propositions, this is equally going to pose a problem. If there's one person that honestly believes they're in the matrix, but just has a lot of beliefs about it, they just think about it all the time, that set of beliefs might grow larger than the other. Or perhaps there's a subset, a small group of people that all believe this hallucination of sorts, and their set of beliefs is somehow larger than the fully consistent set of beliefs that the rest of us believe. It seems that this would pose a big problem for the coherence theory. Additionally, people have drastically different beliefs on the subject of big philosophical questions like morality, the existence of God, the possibility of free will, and so on. Does it really make sense to decree that whichever set is the most complicated, in effect whichever is the largest, is the true one? Surely not. It would mean that if even people's minds change on a huge issue, say the morality of slavery, the coherentists would be committed to saying that slavery was moral when everyone believed that it was, but now it is not. And if everyone decided, or even just enough of us decided, that it would be ethically okay to enslave people again, then it would be. This seems to be a conclusion that's really too tough to stomach. The system that claims the propositions that we will accept when we reach the end of our reasoning capacity seems to avoid the version of the objection just offered, but it's not going to be able to escape the power of the objection as a whole. So imagine two intelligent races, perhaps humans and another alien race. They have very different kinds of intelligence and see the world in drastically different ways. When each of the races reaches the end of their reasoning capacity, they have a coherent set of truth bearers. But the two sets are in some way contradictory, or perhaps completely different. How could we say that one of them is correct and the other is wrong? There's no proof that we will all come to the same conclusions. And in fact, such problems as the problem of underdetermination seem to point to many of our conclusions being arbitrary and really irrational. Because we are finite and we're not able to perfectly reason, it doesn't seem that when we reach the end of our reasoning capacities, we're going to have all the answers or all the right answers. There might be an alien race that's just smarter than us. When they reach the end of their reasoning capacities, perhaps it's going to be a better picture. But what's to say that their reasoning is better than ours? Because the only thing that is true is what coheres with whatever set of propositions we choose. Once again, we'll have the problem of deciding which set is right, and surely each set is going to say of itself that it is right. So, we have no criterion to distinguish between which set we're actually talking about when we're talking about what our beliefs should cohere to to make them true. 
Moving on, there's another objection that kind of adds on to specification and adds something called the KK regress, or the knowing that you know regress. As Walker notes, this objection gains an even sharper point when partnered with a version of the KK knowing that you know regress. Basically, for the system of beliefs, the coherentist is committed to the claim that all of those beliefs are in fact believed. But what makes the claim the system of beliefs is believed true? That it coheres with part of the system? This would mean that the system of beliefs is believed must itself be believed. What in turn makes that claim true? Well, that it's in some way believed in a coherent part of the system. It should be clear that this is going to devolve into an infinite regress requiring us to believe an infinite number of propositions or else ground claims like the system is believed in some fact about the world. Basically, the only way we can ground the claim the system is believed is in some other claim or some other higher level belief claim about that claim. And it's going to continue on forever. We're never going to be able to ground our regress. Young thinks that he can combat such an objection. According to Young, for any theory to be a theory of truth, it must give the truth conditions of any true proposition, which is surely an infinite number of propositions. The regress, according to Young, is virtuous, since the correspondence theory will have to engage in exactly the same regress. If we define truth as some truth bearer corresponding to some truth maker, then for any truth, it must be true that that truth maker corresponds to some truth maker. That truth bearer corresponds to some truth maker, rather. So that statement must itself correspond to some truth maker. Therefore, it must be true also that the truth bearer, that truth bearer corresponds to some truth maker, does itself correspond to some truth maker. I realize that that was really confusing, and we use the words truth bearer and truth maker probably more than any other word in those sentences. So let's take a look at maybe some more specific examples that will hopefully at least give you the intuition that Young's trying to bring about, as well as the intuition of the original objection. So basically, take the spider is on the web. For the coherence theory to find this true, it must be the case that 2a, 1 coheres with the system. But for that to be true, then it must be the case that 3a, 2a, coheres with the system. But this is clearly going to devolve into a regress. For 3a to be true, we have to have a 4a, a 5a, a 6a, and so on and so forth. There's never going to be any end to it, what just makes even one true. Young points out, though, that this is going to apply to coherence as well. For the coherence theory to find that 1 is true, it must be the case that 2b, 1 corresponds to some fact about the world. But for 2b to be true, we have to have some 3b, such that 2b corresponds to some fact about the world, is itself true. Basically, Young's point is that this regress is not inherent to coherence, but rather to truth itself. Although it might seem that this disbands the objection, it seems to only do that if you're a coherence theorist, or a correspondence theorist, rather. As a skeptic, there's no problem if none of the theories end up working. That's kind of the skeptic's whole point. If there is a systematic problem with truth, that it requires us to either have an infinite number of beliefs or an infinite number of facts about the world, that's a real problem, especially if it affects all theories of truth. And the correspondence theory might respond that there is no problem with an infinite number of propositions being true in their sense. There's not a problem with an infinite number of facts, but there might be a problem with an infinite number of propositions being believed, because it doesn't really seem that we can believe an infinite number of propositions, but we might be able to conceive of there being an infinite number of things in the universe, there being an infinite number of facts about the matter. It doesn't seem strange that there are an infinite number of truths in the world, but it does seem strange that we would have in some way an infinite number of beliefs. So possibly the correspondence theorist can in some way respond one way or another. It seems to me this objection is going to be powerful against the coherence theorist. Another objection we'll look at is called the transcendence objection. This is the problem that there are some propositions that we consider true even though no one believes them or knows them to be true. 
They do not cohere with our system of beliefs, but nonetheless we consider them to be true. For example, we consider that one of the statements, the number of humans alive exactly 5,000 years ago was even, and the number of humans alive exactly 5,000 years ago was odd, to be true, yet neither cohere with our set of beliefs. No one has a belief one way or the other, and surely no one has a true belief one way or the other. You can do this with distant places as well as time. We consider there's a fact of the matter about a star being several billion light years away or not, even if we're implicitly unable to observe it at this moment, perhaps because the light is still traveling to us from there. It's important to note that the coherentists that hold that a set of propositions that makes up our system is the one that's believed by God or an infinitely powerful God in some way, are relatively immune to this criticism, since God would know even propositions that we may never come to know, and therefore be able to make them true or false in some way. But this is going to be a much more serious objection for the other coherence theorists. The only real defense for them is to bite the bullet, and simply insist that there is no fact of the matter about whether the number of humans alive 5,000 years ago was even or odd. They can do this, but it's going to come at a very high price for the coherence theorist. Basically, the coherentist is going to need to give up what's known as realism about truth. This means not only are they going to be denying, not just doubting, but denying the law of the excluded middle, since there will be some propositions that are neither true nor false. Neither them nor their negation is going to cohere with the system. And the principle of transcendence, which claims that statements can be true and yet cannot be known. Any statement that can be true must be able to be known. This is going to butt up against a lot of problems in philosophy in a lot of ways, such as Girdles and completeness theorems, and Fitch's paradox, to give a few. It may seem like this gives up the game, but this just means that the coherentist needs to find something other than classical logic to support their philosophy, because they can't help themselves to some of the central tenets of logic, and they're going to have to really work hard to solve some of those problems I just mentioned. In the end, while the coherence theory may escape being committed to things like idealism or the coherence theory of justification, it cannot escape the commitment to strange things like denying realism about truth or at least claiming that they have some way to defeat the possibility of an evil deceiver being in place of a god. There are a lot of problems for the coherentist to sort out before it can represent a complete theory of truth that our intuitions are not going to balk at. That was the coherence theory of truth. Next up, we're going to be talking about pragmatism, followed by deflationary theories of truth, pluralist theories of truth, Tarski's theories, Kripke's theories, the revisionist theories of truth, and finally, the two truths of Tibet. Check out the SEP for more information. James O. Young has a good paper on the coherence theory of truth. Watch this video and more here at carnities.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.